Good morning. Thank you for being with us today for our worship. We're going to be singing Christ Be My Leader. Stand. Christ be my Savior, who come and do strive. Death cannot hold me, for he is the one. We begin our worship in the name of the only true God, the triune God, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Let us then confess our sins unto God our Father, most Amen. merciful God. That we are by nature sons of the unclean. We have sinned against thee in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved our neighbors. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. Sick of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, renew us, renew us. In us, that we can be right in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus was given to die for us, and it is for his sake that our sins are forgiven. Now, as a called and ordained servant of the word, I announce the grace of God to you. And by the authority of Christ, I therefore forgive you all of your sins in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Oh, give thanks to the Lord. Call upon his name. He spread a cloud for covering. They asked, and he brought quail. He opened the rock and water gushed out. For he remembered his holy promise. So he brought his people out with joy. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, call upon his name. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. 
For this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. This is the feast. The Lord be with each of you. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, though we do not deserve your goodness, still you provide for all of our need of body and soul. Grant us your Holy Spirit that we may acknowledge your gift, give thanks for all your benefits, and serve you in willing obedience through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Please be seated. summon nations you know not, and nations that you do not know will listen to you, hasten to you, because of the Lord your God and the Holy One of Israel, for he has endowed you with splendor. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. If you would, please rise for the reading of the gospel. The gospel for this Sunday is recorded in the gospel according to St. Matthew, the 14th chapter, beginning with verse number 13. Now, when Jesus heard about the death of John, he withdrew from there in a boat to a desolate place by himself. But when the crowd heard it, they followed him on foot from the towns. When he went ashore, he 
saw a great crowd. He had compassion on them and healed their sick. Now, when it was evening, the disciples came to him and said, This is a desolate place, and the day is now over. Send the crowd away so that they can go into the village and buy food for themselves. But Jesus says, They need not go away. You give them something to eat. And they said to him, We only have five loaves and two fish. And he said, Bring them here to me. Then he ordered the crowd to sit down on the grass. Taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked to heaven, and he said a blessing. Then he broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples, and the disciples gave them to the crowd. And they all ate and were satisfied, and they took up twelve baskets full of the broken pieces left over. And those who ate were about five thousand men, not counting the women and the children. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise Let us confess our faith through the words of the creed as we find it in our handout. I believe, maker of heaven and earth, is Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried, descended into hell. Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. If you would please be seated and let us sing together, Rejoice, Rejoice, Believers. Rejoice, rejoice, believers, your light appears. God's grace and his peace be with each of you this day through our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. 
In the last few weeks, we've had some parables dealing with the kingdom of God. Jesus was teaching the people in righteousness as to what the kingdom of God was like. Then he hears about the death of John, his cousin. And he goes out into the desert to mourn. And the crowds, the people from the towns in the vicinity, see in the direction he's going, and they follow after him. It's strange how there's no rest for Christ. And we have what takes place, the miracle of the loaves and the fish. Now, this miracle is a staple in our pericopal system within the church. We have it every single year. And, and I got to tell you, I must have uh, seen this text at least in my lifetime 60, 70 times. It's one of those special texts that we cherish from our childhood. It's recorded in all four Gospels. Why, Luke even has not one feeding, but two. A later one that takes place closer to the crucifixion. In studying God's Word, I have found that Jesus does nothing haphazardly. Everything that He does is for a reason, especially when He is instructing us in righteousness. And when I look at this miracle, I see more than just a miracle. I, in my heart, also look at it as a parable. As what Jesus is, who He is, how He operates, and what the elements in the miracle have to say to us as to the kingdom of God and what it's like. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm not saying this is a parable. This is a miracle that takes place. But the language is picture language. And that strikes of being like a parable. And that's what Jesus does here. In accomplishing this most miraculous act, there are some elements that we need to look at. First, who Jesus is, then the baskets, if they apply to God, they are that which hold the bounty and the blessings of God. If we apply the baskets to us, they receive all the bounty that God offers. The basket is our life. Hunger is our need for God's mercy and grace. The fish and the bread, well, that's the gospel of God. The word that brings that mercy and grace into our life to quench our thirst for righteousness. The 12 filled baskets of leftovers demonstrate the abundance of God's love for us and the willingness of our Heavenly Father to be forgiving as he deals with us. This miracle offers us a lot more than just a miraculous act. It teaches us some very important things. I want to talk to you about three of those this morning. The first deals with Christ himself. Christ, in his human nature, because he is both God and man, mourns for his cousin. They had grown up together. They had spent Passovers with the family. They probably played together from time to time. 
And in his human nature, he sorrowed at the loss of his cousin. It is this Jesus that we see in this miracle. The text says that when he looked out at the crowd, that vast number of people that could be into the tens and fifteens of thousands, he had compassion on them. Jesus sees the needs of the people, not just the hunger for something to eat after a long day of following him and learning at his feet. He sees beyond the physical need straight into the depths of their souls. He sees their need for what he brings as Messiah, as Savior. Just as they hunger and thirst for food, they do so for the message of the kingdom as well. He sees their need, their desire to know about the hope that he brings and he addressed that need. In his heart, you are no less than these that are standing in front of him. He sees your need for his love, for his mercy and his grace, just as they did. In Christ's word and action, there is a deeper message here than just doing a miracle. God in Christ loves us. And he desires that all men be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth that Jesus is his son, that his son in his love dies for you for the forgiveness of your sins and that in three days he rose up again to ensure your justification because of his love for you, because of his compassion. Now the word compassion is used more than oh, just about 20 times in the New Testament. In his compassion, Jesus is literally the embodiment of God's love and is moved with concern and sympathy for man's sinful condition and his lost state. He is filled with kindness and consideration to involve himself in our need and do something about it. But while we were yet sinners, while we were at the enemies of God, while we were not in a relation with him, he loved us, the scripture says. And he demonstrated that love in Christ. And Christ gave his life for us. All because of his compassionate love for us. Now, secondly, in that love, Jesus gives all he is all that he has, and he does it with abundance. Jesus says, in my Father's house, in John, there are many mansions, and I go to prepare one for you. God is an abundant God. There aren't just some mansions. There's just not a small place in heaven for us. There is enough room in heaven for every man, woman, and child, whoever was born and whoever will be born before Christ comes again. The unfortunate thing is that the majority of them reject the love and the grace of God. And they don't benefit from his abundance. Where we see a lack, he shows his abundance. Where we see emptiness, well, he fills our life with joy and peace. Jesus is not half full, nor is he half empty. He's overflowing. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. And in John chapter 10, verse 10, it says of Jesus, I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. Now the crowd ate. They ate on the word of God and they followed after him because they wanted more. And they ate on the abundance that Christ gave to them as creator. 
And it is such a beautiful example, this miracle of God's love for us. Our life is filled with God's abundant grace because of His abundant love. He goes all out for us. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, so that whoever believes in Him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Jesus, John tells us, did not come into the world to condemn the world. That the world, though, would be saved by him. And all those that believe in the name of the only begotten of the Father have eternal life. If one is condemned, John tells us it's not because of their sin, it's because of their unbelief. The crowd was satisfied. Lastly, this miracle is the very epitome of the gospel. While it brings comfort in knowing Jesus as benefactor, it also challenges us. In other miracles, we see Jesus is uh, dealing with people and their specific problems. And he does everything he can to help those people. And we see him doing it. He prays to the Father. He lays on hands. He commands demons. He reaches out and miraculously heals those who need his presence in their life. Well, this miracle is much like them, but there's a second element to it. You know what it is? It's his disciples. It's you. As the gospel begins, the disciples are ready to dismiss the crowd. They tell Jesus to send them away into the town so that they can buy food. Well, with that many people, the town surely was not going to be able to provide food for them. There were just too many. But Jesus asks them to feed the people. They say, how can we do that? We only have five loaves and two little fish. Jesus tells them to bring that to him. He blesses it. He gives it to them and he tells them to feed the people. He turns to the disciples who were acting as gatekeepers into godly servants. He instructs them to share that abundance with the people. Now this is a teaching moment for the disciples and for us. We're not meant to be passive in our reception of the gifts that God gives to us. His mercy, His grace, His forgiveness. But we are to be active conduits of all of this in love to other people. We don't come to Christ merely to be fed we also, in Christ, are there to feed others. And that's the essence of our discipleship. Now, it doesn't mean occasionally going to a food bank and feeding the needy on a Thanksgiving day. It's not giving a, a contribution to a certain charity. It is a commitment to sharing the love of Christ and the gospel of salvation in Christ with others just as we ourselves have freely been given it. It is following in the footsteps of Christ, sacrificially giving of ourselves as Christ has given himself to us. Like the disciples when they fed the hungry crowd, Jesus expects us to be loving, 
nurturing and caring for others, especially those in need. The poor, the widow, the orphan, the infirm, the aged, the addicted, the unloved, the outcasts. We are to reach out to all of them with the love and the grace of God. Now, while the gospel reports a crowd, we've got to remember that these are God's people. Each one of them, every man, every woman, and every child was a beloved child of our Heavenly Father, just like we are. Each one was fed, and they went away satisfied. Both, <coughs> Satan's getting me. Both in their body <coughs> and in their soul. God the Son knew them and loved them and died for them while they were yet sinners. Jesus knows the love each one of us has in our own dealings with our families, but he also knows our failings, our shortcomings, our sinfulness. And he gave his life as a payment for that sin on behalf of each and every one of us, for we too are the beloved of God. He lived and died for us. And through Christ, we receive the mercy and the grace of God. And it fills our basket, our lives, with the overflowing mercy and grace that God offers. In that blessed assurance, which is from Christ, we have a place in heaven forever. In Psalm 34, it says of Jesus, Taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes him for his refuge. With the disciples, with the crowd, we are blessed of the Father. Jesus is the Son of God, the second person of the Trinity, equal to the Father in all things. John reminds us that it is Jesus who is the creator, that he is the creator, not the greater, but it sounded like that, didn't it? He's the creator. And everything that was created was created by him. And nothing that is is created without him. He took that bread and he changed it into an uncountable, abundant meal. And they all fed on that meal. And they were blessed. But even more so, he taught them the gospel truth of the kingdom of God. And they fed on that. He fed their physical body and he fed their spirit and they were blessed. He gave of his abundance to what, 15, 20,000 people? Because remember, there were 5,000 men and then there were women and children on top of that. And I've learned over the years that there's always more women than there are guys in a church. It probably was the same back then. God never runs out. It's not half full, not half empty. He is overflowing. And his abundance is poured out on us. And that abundance fills our lives. The scripture says that God comforts us. That's part of that blessing. And he comforts us so that we can be a comfort to others. Scripture points out that we are blessed by God to be a blessing to others. And so we as the children of God, as the redeemed, need to reach deep into our basket of blessings and share them with those who are in need. Share the grace and the mercy of God and his love from that bottomless basket that Jesus provides to each of us. Your life is blessed in Christ. 
Your hope is assured in Christ. Make sure others know it as well. Our discipleship demands that. Nothing more, nothing less. A full measure pressed down, poured out so others are blessed as we are. Now may the peace of God, which surely goes beyond all of our understanding, keep your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus. Amen. Um, I'm going to ask you to please rise. Oh, no, stay seated. We're going to have the offering and then prayer. One of uh, our dear members said, don't forget, there's lunch today. Keep it short. <laughs> I got a little bit caught up, and, and I'm saying there's something missing here. I had two pages stuck together. So there was another page that you guys didn't get. <laughs> and I know someone's out there saying, oh, thank you, Lord. One of the things that we were talking about in our Bible class today, uh, I just forgot what it was. <laughs> uh, don't you just hate that? Prayer. Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane on the night in which he was betrayed told his disciples to stay awake and pray while he went off and prayed. Well, that's a blessing for us to be in prayer. But it's something that a lot of Christians don't do. Gallup found that the average Christian prays less than five minutes a day. That means there are a lot of Christians that pray a lot, and then there are a lot of Christians that do what? Don't pray at all. Um, and that's unfortunate. But we are a people of prayer. We follow the example of our Lord and Savior. So if you would, please rise for prayer. Most gracious God, into your hands, we commend ourselves, trusting in your grace for us, Pour your absolution out upon us and make us your children of grace to others. Help us to demonstrate your love to them and be a blessing in their lives. Lord, in your mercy, for our leaders, right now, Lord, it's shameful what's going on with the top of the leadership in this nation. Move them to heed your word and to apply good morals and ethics to the job that they have been asked to do on our behalf. Help them to look at the nation first and their party second. That the need of the people outweighs anything else in this nation at this time. Lord, in your mercy for our Senate and our district and our congregations, help the pastors to be true to the gospel and committed to proclaiming that which saves. Lord, in your mercy for Clarice, who had a heart attack on Monday who is at St. Luke's. May the doctors truly care for her and may the medication accomplish the task that the doctors are hoping it will, that it will help to open the artery a little bit so that she doesn't suffer another heart attack. We ask that you would be with Brent, with Billy, with Steve, with Brian and Linda. 
Place your hand of healing on them to make a blessing in their lives. We thank you that Cooper is not facing cancer, but Lord, give the doctors the ability to care for the need that he does have. I thank you for the blessing of life and for another birthday next week. Give me more years, Lord, to serve you. Lord, in your mercy, for Sarah and Brett as they celebrate a birthday on the 10th, a birthday, an anniversary, bless them, Lord, now and always. We pray for our military. We ask that you be with them to keep them safe from harm and danger as they serve us and keep us free. In your hands, O Lord, we commend all of those for whom we pray, trusting in your grace and praying that prayer that you taught us to pray. Our Father. In that night in which our Lord was betrayed, he took bread, he blessed it, and he gave it to them, and he said, take and drink you all of it. For this is my body given for you, this do in remembrance of me. After they had supped, he took the cup, and he blessed it, and he gave it to them, and he said, take and drink you all of it. For this cup is the New Testament in my blood shed for the sins of all. Do this as often as you possibly can remembering everything that I've done for you. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Everything is prepared. Come to the table of the Lord. Come. Take and eat, for this is the body of Christ. Take and drink, for this is the blood of Christ. Now, May this true body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen and preserve you in true faith unto life everlasting. Go in the peace of the Lord and serve him. Walt. this to Deborah. Get this side here. Yeah, come on. You would please fill up this side. We don't do an empty rail. Okay, wonderful. Come. 
take and eat, for this is the true body of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, given into death for all of our sins. Take and eat, for this is the body of Christ. Take and eat the body of Christ. And Lord bless you and keep you in his grace now and always. Take and eat the body of Christ. And the Lord bless you through his promise of grace now and through eternity. Take and eat the body of Christ. Take and drink the blood of Christ. This is the blood of Christ shed for you. Take and drink, for this is the true blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, given into death for all of our sins. Take and drink the blood of Christ. Now may this true body and blood and these blessings strengthen and preserve you in true faith unto life everlasting. Go in his peace and serve him. This is the true body of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, given into death for all of our sins. And the Lord bless you now and always. Take and eat, for this is the body of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, given into death for all of our sins. Whoops. Take and eat the body of Christ. Take and drink the blood of Christ. Okay. Did you get the wine? Now, may this true body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ and this blessing strengthen and preserve you in true faith unto life everlasting. Go in his peace and serve him. Rise and receive the blessings of the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and to be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with his countenance and give you his everlasting peace. If you would please be seated and let's close with our final hymn.
Nope, ain't back yet. 